And the first item is adjustments to the agenda. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Okay. Um, I don't have any. A big focus for tonight is to talk about the budget. Okay. And we've got a bunch of policies. Yeah. Um, do we need a timekeeper or should we, uh, we haven't really been using that the last few times that, does anybody want to have a timekeeper or should we just, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think we've done okay without a timekeeper the last few times we've been okay. ending on time. Great. I and I see, I see that Andrew has joined us. So I'm going to pass the baton to Andrew. We just uh, were on item four, public comment. Okay. Is there any public comment? Looks All like right. we've got folks on, Andrew, that are, I don't see any callers other than in private. Um, I don't know if any of the other members want to turn on their mic if they have anything to comment. Okay, well, it sounds like there isn't any public comment at this time. So uh, let's move on to approving the minutes, the consent agenda. So for this, we have the minutes of Tuesday, October 20th. have a motion to approve them or does anybody have any adjustments they'd like to make i make a motion that we approve the minutes from october 20th i'll second that okay all those in favor of approving the minutes of October 20th, say aye. 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 Okay, we have approved the minutes. Okay, moving on to board comments. Do we have any board comment at this time? Uh, I have a comment. Uh, just just wanna let everybody know that uh, my, my uh, term is up this year and I will not be uh, seeking reelection. So if you want to start recruiting somebody to take my place, something okay. well sorry to hear that rodney yeah i'm sorry to hear that rodney yeah it's been uh it's been an experience that's for sure and whatnot and I, for the most part i've enjoyed it but right at this time i just need to focus on my business and family totally understand you're supposed to run that by me though <laughs> Well, thanks, Rodney, for letting us all know um, so early on so we can reach out to somebody in the Bethel community, take your place, and thanks for being a part of this. It's been quite a ride. Um, for another board comment, I don't, I don't know if I missed it. Did we get a report from the VLA principal or? Or do we not have one of those right now? I did not do that this uh, for this report, Chris. Okay. Um, and then mostly just because last week was just a whirlwind. And I forgot to ask her, so I apologize. Okay, do we have any other board comment before we move on? Um, so I don't know if it, uh, I guess maybe, I guess under superintendent's report i guess when we talk some more about vla there i guess i have just one question or one thought on something you know related to the vla uh, but I don't oh, know that sounds great chris okay we'll save it for there okay well i think that's up next on our agenda anyway so okay why don't we move on and jamie can take the floor from there um so it's uh it's, you know, it's pretty busy in the COVID land right now. 
Um, and so, you know, I want to celebrate the fact that we are one of the few supervisory unions um, in in our part of the state that have not had a any type of confirmed case within the school population. So I think we should pause to celebrate that. Uh, I'm knocking on wood, but uh, folks have been working very hard. Uh, we've asked folks to sacrifice a lot, and I I recognize that. Um, and so, you know, I, I'll say that when, you know, I signed on to be your superintendent of schools, I certainly didn't know that I was also taking on the responsibility of deciding how we would navigate um, a pandemic, because there certainly is a lot of responsibility placed on the superintendents around navigating this. Um, I believe that the procedures and processes we have in place are appropriate for us to continue to move forward with in-person instruction um, while we are ensuring that we continue to mitigate risk um, and um, communicate in a proactive way to our, our community. And so I'm looking to change some of our approaches to communication with the community um, in general to ensure that they understand when updated guidance is um, occurring. I mean, we certainly have a, an effort to use social media and um, written communication via email. Um, and I certainly try to use our Blackboard Connect system, but I'm going to look into uh, talking with Ray of how do I utilize maybe more video type communication in social media and email presence to communicate that way. I know, Ms. Bowen, you do that quite well. And so I think I, you know, maybe I'll wear the fedora my first time out. But I think that, you know, sometimes the things we put out are a bit dense. I've tried to address, adjust our writing style to make certain that folks are able to glean the most important information from it. Um, this continues to change daily now. I mean, I would say that I get updates from Secretary French one to two days, two times a day that I'm having to dig into with Shane Oakes, who's done a marvelous job of our COVID-19 coordinator to just ensure that we have updated information and are communicating that appropriately and timely. Um, one of the things that got put up, put on school districts um, last week uh, with, mu with not much notice was a surveillance testing, which we're gonna be doing for the first time in RSU tomorrow. Um, all the specifics around that were finally released on Friday. Um, and so uh, Mr. Oaks and I will be the test administrators for that um, to, to pilot the first time for volunteer testing as staff for COVID-19. Um, we're hoping to get those results back by Friday or Monday at the latest for staff and staff will be contacted directly um, in the event um, that there was a positive case and then via email um, when they're negative. Um, this was an effort from the Agency of Education separate from the Department of Health. Um, I think that everyone's in support of it. I would say that from my office, the frustrating thing is that it hasn't come with any support to implement it. Um, and so that, that also has fallen on the supervisory union and school districts to implement. Um, you know, folks continue to ask, are we gonna stay open? And yes, the answer is yes. Um, I think the governor has been clear, um, even again today, in his address that his focus is to keep schools open for in-person instruction um, and that you know spread within schools when you look at contact tracing is been very minimal less than three incidences across the state that they believe occurred via school transmission um, and so what we're noticing is a great deal of transmission that's occurring outside of schools and so that's really where my focus is on. I met with the SU nurses this morning to talk about how can we, through kind of marketing and celebration that we've been able to stay open, also make certain that we're communicating to folks that the recommendations that have been occurring about how we um, socialize, how we travel, and how we can really conduct our day-to-day our -day lives um, after eight to three are so critical for us to continue to stay in person. Um, and I wanna thank our communities because I think the fact that we are in person right now and haven't had to go virtual speaks to the fact 
that folks had been following that guidance. Um, and so I'm unbelievably appreciative of that. Um, I also want to just, you know, in addition to my report, say that the Thanksgiving break couldn't come quick enough. I think folks are pretty, pretty tired. I think the faculty and staff, this is taking its toll right now. Um, and I'm looking forward for us to be able to, to refuel our, our tanks um, and get ready for the push into the holiday break and gearing up for um, what I hope is the first time that we have to Im implement virtual learning um, across the SU will be that week of January um, 4th. Um, with that, it's taken a lot of strategic planning because in addition to going completely virtual again, um, we've also had to ensure that we make, made certain we were ready to roll out with our, our lunches and our meals because any point um, if we were to go virtual, that's required to count it as a student day. Um, so I wanna acknowledge that the food service staff has worked hard with that planning and preparation. Um, our blizzard bags are out um, across the supervisory union so that we can go to remote learning as we gear up for virtual. So a lot of planning has been done by folks to ensure that, that we're able to transition at any time we need to. Um, one of the areas, and I, and I don't know, Chris, if this is what you were getting to, that we've struggled with a bit is around substitutes for the Virtual Learning Academy. Um, and so that's, you know, one of those things that Lindy and I are trying to navigate. Um, I had to um, assign both Amy Toth and Lindy to teach last week in the Virtual Academy um, to cover because we had staff out. Um, and it's just like schools for in-person learning. There's days that we are scrambling for in-person learning subs right now um, when we have staff out. Um, and we've had floating subs in some buildings and in other buildings, we've struggled with staffing levels. Um, an example is one of your sister districts up the road in FBUD have struggled mightily um, with staffing levels right now. Uh, the other thing that we continue to see is that we have had increased um, turnover in staff this year. I think some folks have continued to consider whether or not um, the demands that are placed in the field of education on top of uh, dealing with a pandemic, whether it's worth it. And so our resignations have been higher than they have been previously. And that's required us to continue to try to add additional staff throughout the school year um, while trying to make certain we're maintaining what we need in place to best support students. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of my verbal update in addition to all the great things that I talked about within my report, but um, those are all several additions um, just from when I completed the report last week to now um, that I wanted to bring you update to update you on. And I'll take any other questions folks have. Yeah, so that was going to be my comment or question. It was about subs for the virtual academy. Um, you know, I know that, uh, yeah, last week, uh, you know, there was, uh, you know, teachers uh, were out and it's, you know, and it was, you know, completely reasonable and just like normal school. But, uh, yeah, I know uh, Lindy did a good job stepping in to help out uh, when she could, but, you know, she's also juggle juggling several other uh, roles and hats right now, too. So, uh, you know, if, yeah, if there's any way to find, and I know that it's, you know, not a lot of people out there, but, uh, you know, if there's some people that we can identify as, you know, people that are able to help out with subs on the virtual side, it would be good just to give a presence uh, and not have it fall to the to the paraeducator and, and then principals to step in. I think the plan, Chris, is that we're gonna try to post to see if we can get a regular floating sub for VLA like we have in the schools is sort of the game plan that I've tentatively come up with with Lindy. Um, I have a question. Um, just wondering what, the protocol is when when students in the school that are going and is showing up physically for attendance but then they get a cold um you know we've had it happen in our household twice now where 
our kids got in a cold and he's got asthma so it's easy to get congested but as soon as there's a symptom he's out and then can't go back in until he's got a doctor's note and the doctor won't give a note until he's had a covid test and to have a covid test sometimes it takes a couple days to get in to get a test and then it takes three to five days to get a result so he's ultimately out for a week if there's a sniffle and so how can he how can my kid or any other kid how what's the plan for making sure that they get enough support for the classes that they're missing and or you know obviously there's virtual learning that's happening but it's not at the same caliber and there's the uh, you know the possibility of falling behind um so uh, i'm just wondering what kind of game plan there is for that because there doesn't really seem to be much from our experience. It seems like he's, you know, falling behind on some quizzes because the teacher wants to give him in person and he can't show up because he doesn't have written clearance yet. So just, uh, you know, question, just wondering how that's being handled, especially on the middle school, high school level where there's more, more stuff to hand in, more academic work. Well, I can let the principal speak to the middle high school. I mean, my initial, my thoughts around the elementary is, is that, Lisa, that's, that's something that's been concerning to me right along. I'm struggling with how do we have enough staffing met levels to do a mixed model when that happens. Right. The algorithm, of course, is now that we're into cold season, is requiring more students to leave. I think that we've had even folks on my team experience this with their children have been sent home. Um, and has resulted in a, them needing to get a COVID test. Um, and certainly the testing turnaround um, is different based on where you go. Excuse me, I experienced last week where it took me over five days to get a test back. Right, and I think part of it is because of the um, something that happened at UVM, um, some sort of a cyber attack that's, that's making the turnaround um, a lot more time consuming. So going to Gifford is now, you gotta get it takes a week to get an appointment so we did we drove all the way to barry because they've got an outbreak in williamstown so they're taking care of people but it was crazy confusing and haven't gotten a virtual report yet i had to call today to find out that it is negative but i haven't gotten anything in writing yet so that i can't submit anything he can't go until the doctor gets a written report that he can fax to the school so it's just, it's just a lot of, uh, and I understand everybody's just uh, stressed out and over. That is, that is one of those data points that I'm going to have to use to make determinations, right? Separate of us having confirmed cases. If I'm at a place where my staffing levels and the fact that we just have, a, you know, a multitude of students out that we feel like we can do a better job educating virtually, then that's a decision I would have to make and at that point in time. Yeah. Um, and so that is one of those data points that we would use to then determine that it made better sense to go virtual at that point in time than to stay in person. Yeah. Uh, but I am looking for my staff to really utilize Google Classrooms and a lot of the assignments and things should be on there for students when they do go out. So I'd like to hear what the principals have to say about that and how we're leveraging that technology. I can talk at the middle school level. Um, we've had some families that have fallen into that that um, position of having some cold symptoms or some symptoms. We've also had faculty in those situations. And we have pretty clear guidelines on all of that. And what we're doing is following the safety and health guidelines first and making sure that we have remote um, academic support for all of those kids that are out. And as Jamie, I think, intimated with lizard bags, actually explicitly said, and at the high school, middle school, we have a remote plan for when we go remote. It's all set, we've shared it with families, not the details of the plan, but that we have it and the structure. And um, I feel like it's, we're ready for remote and we're ready to support it. It by no means is perfect, but we have a system and it's working. I feel confident in it. Um, 
some some of the key pieces at the high school level uh, have been alluded to, but uh, all the high school teachers are supposed to be putting their assignments on Google Classroom. So a student who, who misses a class just because of a doctor's appointment or dentist appointment should be able to, to log in in real time and see at least what's going on in class and, and you know what the homework assignment was, which is is not a replacement for direct instruction. That's definitely you know a, a weak spot of ours when somebody has to quarantine for you know seven to fourteen days. Uh, but at the very least, there's there's no longer that communication problem of having to get the assignment uh, that you would have had in the old world where the teacher you know wrote it on the chalkboard. Um, the the other big piece for kids who are making work up is our Wednesdays, where you know. Uh, instead of having two and a half or three classes a week, uh, we only have two classes a week. So being out for a week doesn't mean as much of a loss of direct instruction. And then Wednesday, students can access teachers to make things up. So, uh, you know, we've had about two dozen students coming into the building on Wednesdays uh, to work one on one with teachers to make up projects or homework assignments and that sort of thing. Um, that that system is still uh, a little rough around the edges. Uh, you know, we're trying to get that into a routine, but you know, with the half day last week, with the holiday next week, uh, it, it's not you know an ideal system yet. Um, and then the the third component is we gave a lot of incompletes for the first quarter, and we just had a lot of kids who had excused. I, I consider you know, being in quarantine and excused absence. So we got a lot of kids with excused absences uh, and the teachers are being really flexible with leaving their grade books open for students to take the time they need to, to get unfinished work in and, you know, work with the teachers or their classmates to find out what, what they missed and, and get that up to date. Uh, it's not perfect. We, we have tried on a couple instances for teachers to actually teach the class with students uh, who are remote, um, and what we found were there just a lot of technical issues uh, that the the equipment we have and that are you know embedded in the computers don't pick up uh, questions in the classroom uh, or questions. You, it, you can't participate on an equal footing uh, remotely as you can when you're in person because you just can't hear what's going on in class without you know some fancy studio mics. Uh, and a camera that can follow around all the action. Um, so that, that's imperfect, but uh, you know, to the extent we can keep trying things, uh, I'd like to see us do that. And I'm happy to share a little bit about elementary. I think we're in some varying places. Um, and I think we're trying to work with parents where they're at. There's some that really just prefer handwritten assignments be sent home. And then today I will say, as I was leaving the Bethel campus, I had a teacher say to me that um, one of the kiddos that was out was able to log in and on his computer join the reading group that she was doing in live time um, that he couldn't be present for because he's out waiting for a COVID test, but he didn't miss his reading group and it was just like he was there. So um, we're doing it all, a lot of different places. Um, we are util utilizing Google Classrooms in some aspects um, and just trying to work with parents uh, with what works best for their families at this time. Well, thanks. That was all really helpful for me. I'll just keep trying to support my son as much as I can through this. No, and Lisa, I think if you can, you know, feel free, and I, I say this to parents all the time, the more you can give us feedback on what works well and what doesn't, then allows us to use that to get better. Right. Yep, I'll do that. So do we have any other questions for Jamie? Okay, and let's move on to the, uh, what's next? We'll move on to the principal's report. The principals like to speak to the principal's report? Mm -hmm. 
Well, we've, we've got a lot going on. Uh, a lot of our focus has been on MTSS, uh, especially with the new coordinator of student services and our MTSS B coordinators who are with us for their second year. So uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, gelling as a team, um, trying to get our systems up and running. And there are, as you'll see from our report, there are a lot of components to that. Uh, from Crisis Prevention Institute uh, training, which uh, focus on de-escalation and, and things that trigger student, uh, student uh, escalated behaviors, to uh, functional behavior assessment training, to uh, restorative justice training, uh, to a lot of work with the Vermont MTSS guide and the, and we've been getting trained by Michaela Martin uh, and we have our next training Thursday. Uh, we're going to have a training by Ken Cranberg with uh, Life Space Crisis Intervention, uh, which is another program um, that a lot of us have had positive experiences with. Uh, so there's a lot going on in the MTSS domain at the moment. You get, Andrew Owen, you guys want to take one of these? You want me to keep going? You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good to say that. Uh, you know, another another one of our focuses is proficiency based learning uh, with attention to literacy, math and flexible pathways. Um, having Amy Toth working at the elementary level has has been a blessing. Uh, she was at South Royal today working with teachers. Uh, this is a lot of coaching going on, a lot of specific focus on reading instruction and how to improve student reading. Uh, we've got the same same type of focus at the high school. Uh, our literacy team is talking is meet one of our literacy teams is meeting tomorrow to talk about writing uh, and how we work on student writing and reading for authors intent. Um, how we devise some templates for working on that across the curriculum at the high school level. Um, we all are using data teams. To kind of dig into the the reading and math, which is part of our focus of our all of our continuous improvement plans. So um, maybe oh, when you want to talk about the mixed model, which is the second bullet there. Sure. Um, yeah, the mixed model. We continue to use the mixed model of in the building, out of the building. And our goal was Thanksgiving, and I feel really good that we're going to make it outdoors to Thanksgiving. Woohoo! Go Wildcats! And uh, if you follow Facebook at all, you've seen that we are like, the kids are having an incredible time. And one of the things we're focusing on was that they love school. And we know if they love school, they got great like skill sets in elementary and we build on it in middle school. And they love going to school every day that it builds their connection to being loving learning at the high school level. We're also working on those academic skills two days a week in the building, one day remotely, and those two days out in the, in the world. And I know that a few folks have kids that are connected to that. I'm looking, actually, it's just Tammy that has a kid that's directly in there. And we had one kid, I, I don't know if I shared this with you, the quote, the kid was like, I don't know which two days I like better, school or the weekend. That's pretty good. And so um, I'm also, by the way, going to go into the, a different meeting in a little bit. I just wanted to know when I disappear, I'll be at the, S the SUY um, equity meeting that I'm the uh, responsible party now that Mary Ellen's left. But I'm happy to answer questions. Do they know I'm running late? And then in the, the, the third goal, uh, working on community engagement and outreach. Uh, hopefully you're, you're getting to see our bi-weekly news, which is on a regular uh, publish, publication schedule. Uh, I think we're, what, seven or eight pages. Uh, it's probably our average every time we, we put that out. So there are kind of meaty pieces from the elementary, middle, and high school level, uh, including something that, that's come together really nicely is uh, a lot of our work-based learning students at the high school. Uh, have been contributing articles, you know, two or three every two weeks to the, the news. Uh, and a lot of those articles also go on to the, the Herald. So uh, 
We've got a nice involvement of students as, as part of that. Then the other big piece this month is uh, parent teacher conferences. Those look a little bit different this year. Uh, you know, we'll see after Thursday uh, how those all go at the middle school and high school level. Uh, but I think they went well at the elementary level. Uh, Andrew, if you want to add anything there? Maybe not. Well, I, as, yeah, it's definitely new and different uh, doing conferences like this, but um, some of the feedback was that maybe it was easier because they didn't have to drive to school. They could log in, they could access during maybe breaks from work if they work um, not a normal nine to five hours. So we had pretty good attendance. And then just a, a final piece is that the athletics uh, for the high school and the district as a whole uh, feel that our, our communication around those have been good, both with the Herald, with the Wildcat News, but uh, Heidi Wright, our co-curricular director, uh, is using a software platform called Team Snap, Snap, which she's able to use to like instantaneously uh, get information out to families and parents. Uh, and, and this week we held uh, meetings for students who are interested in basketball uh, at lunchtime. So the, the varsity basket, boys and girls basketball coaches were on campus to meet with students for the first time to get ready for their, their upcoming season. And that's the, the bulk of our report. Uh, I, I might add uh, that we're, uh, we're excited that uh, a vacancy in our food service uh, hopefully hopefully get has been filled uh, and we're hoping she'll start in the next week or two uh, that hasn't been settled yet uh, the week after thanksgiving the vacancy in the custodian position at south royalton uh, is it'll be filled so we'll be back at full staff there i think that'll make a big difference uh, in in getting us caught up with projects although uh, we they've been doing a phenomenal amount of work um, getting caught up with the help of two substitutes that we've been bringing in regularly who are both uh, experienced retired custodians. Uh, so they, they know what's needed and they're helping us get, get a good amount done. Any questions or if you want more information about any of that? I have a question. Um, this is really for all the principals. Where where do you see our kids as far as um, their academic level of where they are compared to where they would be if they were in class all the time on a regular school day? How are they doing? Well, the elementary is doing regular day now. Um, and I think they are doing well, and I think it's been a good transition to the regular day. And I think what I'm really looking forward to is see the January assessment data to see how much growth they've had since they've been back in school. Um, so I, I feel like they're doing well, honestly. I think that there's a lot of learning going on. And I think like Owen said earlier, it seems like that long break from not being in school people really seem to have an appreciation for it now that maybe they didn't have previously, um, even the kids. So that'd be my two cents. Reed. Well, like Andrew, where, did, where, where would they, where are they compared to where they would be say last year? We can actually pull that report and show you that because we have that data and compare it to where they would have well, been last what, what, year. How do the teachers feel? You know, I, I wouldn't be saying, I haven't actually asked them recently, but um, I'm not having a lot of people run to me worried. I think we have meetings on the kids we're really worried about and, you know, go through the whole EST process. But I, I don't feel like I'm hearing a lot of people saying, oh my goodness, they're so behind. I feel like anything they're saying, they're, they're, they're catching up, they're soaking it up. That I don't hear anything really concerning when I have meetings. I just had a staff meeting today, and I don't feel like that's that's not what I'm hearing. Is like, oh no, we're so worried. I think they feel like there's a lot of pressure, and that is what I'm hearing. And less about um, where the kids are at, and more about you know worrying about going remote and making sure they're ready for that, and making sure the the blizzard bags are ready, and just just making sure that they are prepared to have, meet the kids where they're at, wherever we're at. Okay. 
is more what I'm hearing from teachers right now. Thank you. Uh, Bob, I think by and large at the middle and high school level, the, the general feeling among students and teachers is that uh, they're really happy to be able to be in school four days a week. Um, and I mean, there's definitely a positive academic lift that's coming from that and not being there just two days a week. Uh, but I think the really important part is the social emotional piece of getting to see friends and having some sense of normalcy amidst all the chaos. Um, you know, in my Monday meeting with other Vermont high school principals, uh, you know, I, I'm astounded that, you know, a, a good number of schools are still all remote at the high school level. They just decided that it would be safer for them not to be back in person. Uh, and of those that are back in person, they're, some are meeting every other week and the, most of them are divided into two cohorts like we were for the first six weeks. So the kids are really missing out on direct instruction that, uh, you know, we're, we're able to deliver at a higher level than other folks. So um, I, I am almost embarrassed to, to raise my hand and, and talk about some of the successes we're having because it, it really is not uh, the typical experience for high school students in Vermont right now to be in school four days a week. And even on the Wednesday, we have kids coming in to get one-on-one -on -one help. Uh, most schools are using that Wednesday and it's all virtual help you know, via email. And so the, the kids who are really disengaged and unmotivated, they're, you know, those three days of asynchronous learning are, are really not that meaningful to them. And, and you know, I feel that way about my son's experience where he's in school two days a week and has to check into a meeting on, on Wednesdays for five minutes. Uh, I, you know, he's learning something, but it's it's not anything like what it would normally be. Reed, if you went to your if you went to your algebra one teacher tomorrow and said, "Where are you compared to where you would have been last year?" What would he say, or what would she say? Yeah, we we would be behind where we were last year, uh, and the, the you know the two contributing factors are having lost. 12 weeks of, of you know, in-person instruction at the end of last year. So there's a real big gap. Uh, but the other piece is we started the year slow. So while we were getting all these new routines in place, we were only seeing the kids one, one class a week. Uh, and the, the teachers really by the end of that six week stretch, I think by and large, were really looking forward to having the kids two days a week and felt like we weren't meeting their needs uh, as much as we should have been during that time. So, and I think I shared this with the other administrators today. Uh, the kids who started out in the vir our virtual academy, they've been meeting, having two classes a week since the get-go. So in many of those classes, they're actually, you know, farther along in the curriculum than their in-person, you know, counterparts are because they've, you know, they've had one more class a week for six weeks. How do the teachers, um, how, how do they feel about where they are with their curriculum? How do they feel? Well, you know, we, we started when we used those six professional development days at the beginning of the year. And one of our big projects has been to, to focus on the core proficiencies of each class and say, you know, what are the essential, essential components and skills, which is what proficiencies are all about, uh, what is it that we really insist that students need to know when they come out of this class? Uh, and in some ways, it, it's been helpful for our, uh, our work in proficiencies to really focus on the most important things. Uh, and some teachers, I would say, feel a little bit liberated by that to say, you know, we're not going to cover as much this year. That's just the reality. You know, when we're only in person 80% of the time, we're not going to get as much ground gained. Uh, but it's given them license to really focus on what's most important. And, and some teachers feel really good about that. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, on the principal's report, the one comment I would have is, you know, I, I really do like how you guys are focused on those three areas each time so it's great to see the progress on each of the priorities that we have but um you know i don't think it should be the principal's report should exclude everything else you know like 
if there are other things that should be included, they can be included too, I guess, is what I would say. Um, so, I, you know, if there's stuff that's not under those three categories, you know, just have a section on general. So, so Andrew, would, would something like a, a fourth category, which was just general op operations, that yeah. you know, updated you on staff and facilities and that sort of thing be helpful? Right. Or, you know, some sort of intro paragraph that goes over kind of the major things and then you go into the detail on the major priority or something. Whatever, whatever works best, but you know, like it would be good to kind of, yeah, get get a general overview of things and then kind of the specifics on how we're getting on a Yeah. So that we get that stuff each month, but then whatever else is pertinent for the current period. Um, as well. Yeah, like, uh, I mean, it, and it's all happening so fast, it's hard to keep up with it even when I'm in the building and have, uh, check-ins with, with my uh, control technologies uh, mechanic. Uh, we've got uh, seven new ventilation units installed in the high school. Uh, we, we pivoted with how our installations were gonna go because having them in the building and assessing our needs revealed that we had six classrooms that were overlooked because they didn't have univents. Uh, so they go, well, we can't replace the univents, so we're not going to. It's like, well, why aren't we replacing them? Well, they, they don't have it. Um, and they've got this antiquated 60-year-old ventilation system that, that's pretty ineffective. Uh, and so we, good news is just uh, yesterday, we got word from Efficiency Vermont that they're approving us for an additional $19,000 to upgrade those six classrooms uh, by taking some of the units that were gonna be installed in the elementary side and replace units that were there with putting them in where they didn't exist at all before. So uh, a really, really big improvement for us with the grant. Uh, and that's all proceeding on pace. So um, we're excited about that. Although the, the next step requires uh, cutting six holes in the concrete walls uh, in six of the classrooms. So. Uh, scheduling the mason for that and where we're going to move the kids when the saw is running uh, remain problems to be solved. But uh, it, it's great to have better ventilation in, in the building. So, excitement. You know, one, one other thing that uh, didn't make it to the board packet was the school choice and tuition enrollment report. Um, would it be helpful if I presented that and we go through that real quick? All right. Sure. Let's see. So while you're bringing that up, is the elementary still getting some unit vents replaced or were the ones that were intended for the elementary now being shifted over to the high school? Uh, uh, what's the breakdown? Uh, three of the seven classrooms that were slated to get them uh, will get them, but there'll be four that don't have them. Uh, you know, they all have univents that have the same MERV 8 filter in them. So the, you know, the difference is the quality of the efficiency of those units. Uh, you know, one of the things we've seen having opened up the units here in November is that, uh, you know, the filters are doing a great job collecting dust. So we'll, we'll increase the, the period in which we replace those uh, filters. Um, you know, the, the other thing that the elementary classrooms have for ventilation is they have the exterior doors. And so as they go in and out of the building uh, more with COVID, uh, directly out of their classroom doors, they're getting a lot more ventilation than they normally would in normal conditions. Uh, so that was also a factor in, in feeling good about diverting those units. But we're, we're also hopeful that if, if new ventilation funding becomes available in the next round of of aid that we'll be able to apply for for getting those replaced before the end of the school year. Uh, let's see. My presentation is probably not up yet. Here we go. So the the good news is if if you didn't have a chance to look at this yet, that it, once you add up all this raw data with each grade level which which flux, fluctuates dramatically as you can see right now we've got 28 sixth graders but we've got 61 seventh graders 
so the the class size of any given class is for some reason is all over the place uh, which which you know likely could create some some additional challenges to student scheduling down the road but that's down the road but the the nice piece is you can see uh, when we look at the total is that uh, we continue to see some enrollment growth across the district uh, so we've got eight more students enrolled right now than we did uh, this time last year or you know September of last year and if we kind of go down this this list we spelled out where all of our choice students are coming from so we've got 11 choice students uh, coming into the elementary school. Then at the middle school level. I, I just want to clarify. So that's there's uh, 11, that's choice between schools, but only one that's actually tuition into oh. our school. So it's 10 that flop between campuses and then one that's choice from Pittsfield. All right. So it looks like one tuition student in the elementary, one tuition student at the middle school, uh and is ac the the acronym we're using for the alternative classroom andra that question andrew brought me that question today yeah i think owen wrote that so i'm going to assume that's the main <laughs> alternative classroom yeah. so those are the students that help our our uh, adm numbers wildcat institute wildcat institute all right so those are su students um then what do we have sorry going down the list here we've got uh one kid from rochester in the virtual learning academy but that's a su program uh two kids from rochester at the middle school one from hancock one from sharon so there are a couple tuition four tuition students is that five tuition students at the middle school and then at the high school uh our numbers you, show that we We've got 31 tuition really? students. How does the tuition work for the uh, virtual academy student in the middle school? Since you know, presumably They're, they are enrolled in your school. You get tuition. Okay. That will be oh, built. Great. Good. Now that's good news. Awesome. Sorry, I'm going all over the place on you. I forgot I was driving. Yeah. So we got 31 tuition students at the high school. Uh, mostly Chelsea, Tunbridge, and Sharon. And uh, the breakdown of our students that we tuition out to the tech centers is we have nine students uh, from Rand going to Randolph and seven students going to Hartford. Uh, those seven students are only there half time. So that's the equivalent of three and a half uh, tuition payments that, that go out to Hartford for that. And then uh, the last number here is you know, the number of students who choice in and out. Um, and so it, it not a not a significant factor there. Three students uh, who go out to VAST. So that those are a couple students that uh, we still provide a little bit of support to, but are not, you know, aren't in our classes. So we're not getting any tuition money there. Um, and the students in the Raven HARP and EVA program are largely students whose tuition is being paid by uh, the special ed program. Although one of the students at EVA is a locally funded uh, student. What is what is the HARP program? I've heard about. The HARP program is uh, based on life skills um programming and it's something andrew as we look to build more alternative pathways at the high school um, don and i were just meeting today about it um, with tara as we started to continue to work on the su budget um, that i'm hoping that we can address because in addition to the students you have that are enrolled at your high school we have several students across the su that that's where they're placed um, and so what that means is that that's built to the SU budget um, in regards to special education. And so if we had a program here within the our own SU, it would make sense that their placement could then be at our program here. Um, because their, their placement was based on the IEP team and what the students' needs were. So if we can meet that, then it would make sense to keep them here, right here within an RSU. Okay, good. 
Um, the student numbers that, that are going to the tuition or tech center and vast and stuff, are those just from the tuition students or total of all the students? That's all the students. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, mo most of the tuition students. Um, I, I think I pulled out the students who are going to Randolph from that total number of tuition students. I think so we did the total that we're billing, basically. Yep. Right, if they're going to Randolph, we didn't count them as a tuition student because they're not really helping us. Right, and so and that would include like half students for students that are going to Hartford? Yeah, uh, I think we might That's only That's what we did on that list when we originally counted them. Yeah, I think we Unless counted them half of a tuition. Yeah, we did. And what did we have in the budget for numbers? What did we budget for? Anybody remember? 38, Tara? Okay, so and that so this is like 31 high school, I think it was four middle school and one elementary, so 36 total. That's pretty close. Yeah. Yes, we budgeted for 38 tuition students. Yeah, we can See that memory, Andrew? They can't get anything by me. They want to try <laughs> over and over again, but little do they know I'm on it. <laughs> See? I'm, I remember those little, those little bullets. Tara's laughing. They try, they over and over again try to pull stuff by me, and it doesn't happen. Does any anyone have any other questions about this report uh, before I stop sharing the screen? Tara had identified 31 or 38 tuition students. Um, are those 38 tuition students just reflective of high school or was that for elementary, middle and high? That was the total budget amount we put in. Yeah. Right? Other than possible. preschool, preschool was budgeted for separately. Okay, and then um, there was a term that was used um, from a public comment component. What is the Wildcat Institute? So uh, we've been working on what uh, we would call our formally named restorative classrooms. And I believe that we're landing on right now, seeing how it sinks in. Students have had voice in this, the Wildcat Institute. And the Wildcat Institute is present on the Bethel and Royalton campuses? Correct. And was that summarized in here then? Yeah, it was summarized as AC. OK, thanks. You read both of my questions. So, Jamie. Yes. What's the so what's the difference in the revenue figure? Well, I'd like us to go with thirty-five students for tuition, and we budgeted for eight, so we're off about three. And we the tuition was announced at what, Tara? $17,137 per student. So we're short three. So Tara, do you have your calculator out? 52,000, something more around. All right. So I'm looking at town report. 51,000. It looks to me like tuition budgeted in the town report for revenues is $499,750. Is that right? That was the FY20. FY21 is $651,206. Yeah, okay. Um, so how how much less revenue? Fifty three thousand. Just over fifty one, Bob. Is current projection. And that's cons you know I'm I'm putting us down one just to be safe in case someone transitioned out or something. Okay.
All right. Um, shall we move on to the business manager report? Unless anybody has anything else for the principals. Okay, Tara. Thank you. So you all have my report. The only update I had to give was what Reed had already shared that based on a resubmission and reconfiguration of the Efficiency Vermont program, uh, Royalton Campus was able to get an additional $19,000 of funding and I signed the revised subgrant agreement for that yesterday. So great job for them and for the team there to get that additional funding. And then my auditors are here in the office all day tomorrow and Thursday. So we'll be wrapping up the on-site portions of the FY20 audit. Um, Tara, it says here that the uh, fall census report was due on the 6th. Could that be something that you share with us? Um, just because the ADM numbers are different than the enrollment numbers and so easier to track what were our effective enrollment is if we so once those are certified in december andrew okay. then we'll definitely roll those out it usually, it's about december typically okay. um once they certify those i know ray has been working diligently on those um with tara um and so it's submitted but now we don't have any errors but then we'll wait to find out what other revisions they have for us Okay. I would like to see a revenue report. I'd like to see um, an in, on encumbrances on our uh, budget, uh, so that the board can make make good decisions on how much money there is and how much money is being spent. I like that every month. I will add the revenue report, Bob, to the reports that I send directly to the school board each month. Yeah, I think, you know, we have the revenue report, which is the revenue that we've actually received now, but what's actually useful is the projected revenue. So, you know, we have our projected revenue, which is now different from what we had in our budget. So that's kind of what we care about. And not for expected to get out. It doesn't really matter how much we've got so far. So if we could kind of have a somewhat updated projected revenue report on tuition subscribers and what transfers received, you know, I, I don't think it's useful to know how much of that money is actually come in, but knowing what we expect to get as, and have that be up to date with what the current knowledge. Is that what you're asking for, Bob? Or? Our system doesn't generate a projected revenue column. So what I would just need to do to let you know, so you know what to expect to come, is I would just have to export that to Excel, and I would just need to add a column to that as to what I'm projecting. Right. I mean, I would so imagine if you guys if are you... good with that, I'll happily submit that to you every month as well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine it would just be like taking the budget amount and then when you get your tuition student number and then you change that column with like whatever other grant and you change that, just, you know, put a note saying what the difference is. And then yeah, that's what we do. We usually do the budget projections after the first half of the year where we actually give you what we're projecting based on the first half of spending. So, I mean, I can do that part of it quite simply as far as adding additional revenue that I think that's going to come in between now and the end of the year. Right. I mean, I guess if it was just kind of a document that was continually updated, like it sounds like Bob would like updates more often than just like end of the year comes. So, yeah, yeah, I'd like to see him. I'd like to see him every month. And, um, I'd like to see that revenue report show the budget of the amount, show what we received and what we're projected to receive and how it fits into what was estimated in the budget. If, if the board, if you haven't already, I would suggest that the board look at the 19 audit that, that we got and look at the revenue 
projections and look at what we actually received in revenue. You mean what was budgeted? First yeah, what was budgeted and what we actually received. There's a lot of differences. And, yeah, I, think, uh, I think one of the things that we, we came across, Bob, was that the, uh, the estimates for tuition students with the merger were, were overly optimistic. Uh, and that was, was pretty apparent early on that fiscal year. Well, I have it right here from the auditors. Yeah, I mean, I I think we know that there was a lot of revenue shortfalls for that year. And yeah, it's the sort of thing like- 479,000. Right, so there was, a lot of that was tuition students, but then there was also some Medicaid money that was initially budgeted for our district, but then was used for the supervisory union instead. You know, there was a grant shortfalls and stuff as well. So, um, you know, I think that's the sort of thing that when they happen, we need to know about them. And, you know, we right. do our best guess at the beginning of the year, and then we just need to be updated as these things come in. My sense is, like, if I look at that, I'm really surprised. And I'm pretty upset because it's not a good projection or a good example of of uh, the dollars that were spent and i'd like i guess i'd just like to know how there was so wide a gap well bob i can't i can't speak to that because it wasn't my budget i know that i know um and you know i think based on what reed just said and based on what's been reported in the papers prior to my tenure and certainly what i tried to communicate in august is we overstated federal grants and revenues in multiple areas because they were the same dollar was budgeted twice. We over projected tuitions. And what that resulted in is us not having the revenue that we, you know, budgeted. And that's the worst thing you can do in school districts. You heard me say this before, because we can't make things. So if we over project revenue, we're in a lot of trouble um, because we, we don't have things to sell. And so it's hard to make up for that. And when you're talking about, like you say, Bob, close to a half a million dollars back then, that, you know, that is certainly what has helped contribute to the deficits. Um, yeah, Do you know like that when you get your budget in December, revenue will be part of it. And you're gonna, we're gonna say over and over again that we are budgeting very conservatively when it comes to revenue. I would like each one of the board members, if you haven't, to get a hard copy of the, of the uh, um, audit. And I'd like you to read pages 71 to 72. 73. Now I've studied the audit, so I know pretty much what's in there. And I want the board to read it because I think you'll be surprised. And the other thing I don't have is an audit um, of the supervisor union. And I'd like to have that because I'd like to see how the money was spent in the supervisor union. Now I asked for that at the last board meeting and I didn't get it. And I'd like to have it. Um, Bob, I as I shared with you at our last meeting, as soon as I have the physical bound copies, I'll happily give you one. I can print you one from the you website. The electronic version is already up and available to anybody in the public that wants it. Or I can download it and print it for you. And if you're coming tomorrow, I can leave it here for you as well. You don't have, you don't have a hard copy of that right now? No, I haven't received it yet from the auditors. I sent them a follow-up email saying, where are the bound copies of the SU audit? But I don't have okay. that one yet. All right. All right. I only have that electronic version that's available. But like I said, I'm happy to print it for you so you have a hard copy because it's exactly what they send in the bound copy, short of having the spiral binding on it. I think if board members, if you take the time to read it, read those pages of the audit, uh, 
you are you talking about schedule a and schedule b or which like rather than referring to them as page numbers just andrew i did also send you the pages that bob is referring to in that last email okay. i sent out on wednesday i exerted those specific pages from the audit so you do have them in that email that i sent out as well okay. all right if they're separately and jamie um in this year's budget i hope that the revenue figures would be more accurate, I guess. Yeah. And then, uh, and, and like I said, if anything, you're going to see us come in and say to you guys, these are conservative projections around revenue. Um, because I just think that that's, that's what we need to do. And I okay, think and you'll that see the same thing when we budget tonight, we're budgeting at 100%. Um, HRA funding where the district hadn't done that practice in the past, but I think that's critical to ensure that we we budget appropriately for any and all incurred expenses that we may have. Um, I forget what I was going to say. I think well, I just hope the board, I hope you take the time to read the audit. And um, I'm better with hard copies than I am with reading it on a computer, unlike Andrew. So, but I like it. Like it shows a good picture of what happened last year. And I, I'm, it's beyond me to understand why we we're expended over the budget and expenditures, um, and why the revenues were overexpended. I, it's beyond me to understand how that could happen. And I think this year, I would really like um, Tara to sit down with the principals and encumber as much money as you possibly can so that we have an idea about where we are with the budget. And there are schools that have their budgets totally encumbered and revenues encumbered and i have an example of a school that has done that and uh, and it's done very well and they have good budget control and i feel like we lost control of budget last year bob if you would share those examples with me i would truly appreciate it i'd love to see what other schools are doing yeah i will i'm going to send a packet to the whole board yeah i do think that's the sort of thing where we need to do it as we're developing the budget so that then next year when we're in the next budget then that's when it can be done you know i i don't expect that we'd be able to do it this year because you know it'd be a lot of work to go back through every single thing in the budget and encumber it and i don't know maybe that's me making assumptions on what uh, the business office capabilities. Um, I think if we do it going into the budget, have a process in place where we can more easily see when spending something different than what we expect. Um, yeah, and no, you know when things cost differently than what or state amount. Not my experience has been, Andrew, that it that it happens at the end of November, that monies that are going to be spent are put in there as encumbrances. Now that doesn't mean that that's the only money you're going to spend in a line. Like if you have ten thousand dollars in there for fuel and you spend twelve, and you encumbered eight, you're still going to spend. You know, if if your board agrees, and you can, you'll spend the ten. But at least the encumbrance will give you an idea about where you are. And right now, the way we do things, you don't have an idea. No, we don't get a monthly. We don't get a monthly report on the finances, so we don't have an idea. We can't. Well, I mean, we do get a monthly report. It just says what we've spent, but not how that differed from what we expect. It's thirty. It's thirty pages long. I spent an hour and a half to two hours going through that. It can be, it, Tara sent out a, you know, a report that was one page long on expenses. You know, it's possible to do that kind of thing so that the board understands. 
if you give them 30 pages, I'd like to know how many ward members spend an hour and a half to two hours looking at that. I'm guessing nobody, except maybe Andrew. No, I, I've got to say that I've asked for a, a nice summary page in the past, something that really gives us the nuts and, you know, a, a one page or a two page summary so that we could look for any anything that stands out. But uh, yeah, 30 pages, I, I, I don't get to it. Absolutely not. I know. And so the Excel possible. file that gets sent, and maybe it's just, you know, it would be easier if I also PDF the Excel file so that you can print it out. But the Excel file provides several summary pages based on how you want to look at the information. I mean, Andrew created that so that it was very user friendly. And that's all that I had done was just went in and printed the PDF version of the function breakdown of that Excel file. So I'm happy to provide you with summaries, but then historically you've all asked me for the details. So that's why I give you both of the reports. I mean, it takes, in all honesty, it takes me two hours to generate those reports to email to you every month. And I do that for seven entities. That's the job, that's the way I figure. Right, but that's what I'm saying. So I'm, if that's not what you want, I'm happy to give you whatever that you need. Because quite honestly, if you don't want all that detail, it does save me time. If you look at the um, audience, if hey, you Bob, look at, can I just huh? interrupt for a second? Sure, I think that yeah, this would be a good thing to go into in the finance committee meeting. Like working so, on figuring so what out. What I'm exactly. going to recommend is is that we're going to try to get you what you want prior to the finance committee, and then you can give give us feedback at the finance committee, and then from that we'll roll it out to the board, and then you know. Board members that are not on the finance committee can give feedback on that second draft. Yeah, I think that sounds like a good plan. You know, I think that going into the details of exactly all the things that we want on the report is exactly what we have to find. So I think the whole board needs to see that. And I think the, the finance committee understands it and uh, they understand what they're getting and what they're not getting. And I think the board needs to get that information. Again- yeah, Bob, Bob, I'm gonna interrupt you. I just, I just said we were gonna do a draft, have the finance committee give us feedback on the draft and then sell, send the second draft to the full board so that the rest of your board members could then say, does that still meet their needs? And so that everyone can weigh in, but absolutely everyone will get it. I understand. Um, the other I think thing I would say is, is you know, I was on the board that developed the budget, and whatever the 2019 budget. So why don't you give me a call and I could talk to you. I know a lot of went wrong and things like that. So why don't you call me and we can talk through it. I think, I think it needs to be. I think it needs to be discussed before the whole board, Andrew. Uh, okay. Especially, especially if you look at the policy that's being put forth between superintendent and board relations. Right. I think it. I think this stuff. I think it's got to be discussed before the whole board, so the whole board understands exactly what's happening. Well, I mean, if you want to discuss what happened in 2019, this was, we were merging the districts. We were doing our best guess as to what the, um, you know, budget would look like and what the revenues would look like. For the revenues, what we did was we basically just added the two individual districts revenues. And then there was going to be a bunch of new tuition available from the closing of Rochester. Uh, percentage of those, we estimated that we would get a percentage of those tuition students. We basically took our current tuition students and added to what we expect to get. As it was, we wound up with fewer than what we had for MERT. I think partially because we didn't get things finalized as far as curriculum and the other things until after people were making their decisions on where to go. And so we didn't get as many tuition students through that process than what we would have expected. And since that time, our tuition numbers have been going up, up until this year. And after that first year, we, you know, didn't 
we drastically cut down what we were producing next year because of a tuition shortfall that caused depth. Uh, but that was, you know, we did our best guess at the time. And yes, we could have been more conservative, but this was also first year we had that district was that our district was combined. But there was a lot of guessing that went into it. And then that was combined with you know, some of the mistakes that were made as far as uh, you know, the switch over between health insurance and happened in that year. So there was the, um, what's it called? The, one of the health insurance things wasn't budget. So the was, HRAs, Andrew. HRAs, that's what I was. So there were expenses like that. And then there was um, some building expenses that happened that So part of that was um, transition related. But there was kind of a perfect storm of a bunch of things that hit all in the same year. In the year that we were guessing, and there were some areas that were not budgeted for properly, and some areas you know, were budgeted for, and for the most part, being a problem. And then the next year, we did a, you know, we adjusted things a lot. The following year. So, going into this budget year, we're not going to have problems because we've had a budget now for we've had our budget in existence for years now, and so we're able to see a lot better what things actually look like in reality. You know, we didn't have that when we were doing this, but so now we have history. We can see what we budgeted for. You know, we want to make the change. Uh, so that, that's what I would say as far as like summarizing what led to that deficit and why I don't see that as an issue now, the things that led to those. And it's also combined, like when you look at the, the budget report there, this was also in the middle of all that changeover software packages and books of accounts, so things aren't necessarily coded in the, pack, in the same places they were budgeted for. So it's very hard to figure out what exactly went over budget. We spent a lot of time going through that over the last couple of years to understand what happened. Uh, but, you know, it makes the, the audit kind of difficult to just look at, to figure out exactly what happened. Well, if I look at the audit and tell what happened, and I think if you look, if all of you look at the audit, you can tell what happened too. So. Well, what I mean is like specifically, I don't think you can tell me exactly where things were overspent because there's things that are categorized in different ways. So like money is shifted around from where it was budgeted. And so it looks like certain categories are overspent by a lot, but those are actually in a different budget category. So it's, yeah. Anyway, well, we, we ended up with look at the audit, and it's definitely worth going through. But I think I don't know how much utility it has to our current situation going to the next budget, since again there was so many unique things that happened in that year that I don't think apply anymore. Particularly since you know we now have new leadership at the supervisory level, and so you know I th I think we shouldn't see the same things happening because you know that new business office new superintendent new we also have historical data that we can look at from the budget and what we actually spend um in a combined district so you know I, it is worth going over and figuring out what happened but i would not think that it's that applicable to the next budget um, how's uh, this year's or last year's? Uh, how's the budget look? You turned all the you turned everything over to the auditors. I'm guessing. <coughs> how's it look? Sure, I don't think it's adjusted since August, really. Right when we did a projection that they ran in the black and the SU ran in the red. Yeah, I don't have any updated numbers at this point in time. Or the auditors are doing their stuff and. Once they get through that process, I'll have updates. 
You don't under you don't know where your budget is? No, she does. She gave it those numbers. You know, as okay, James are those said, numbers, are our, those our local insane? district was in the black. We ran a surplus in our local district, but that was wiped out by the special education. So we were down. How much was it? It was like, I think it was 50 something. That was gonna be. Bob, I can just say there's been no one's providing me any updates that the numbers I showed you in August have changed. All right. That you, the supervisor union numbers or our budget numbers? Correct. So that the supervisory union had that overrun of, you know, close to 500,000. And then therefore that is gonna put you guys into the red a bit. You were in the black, but of course you pick up over 40%, 40% and change of the SU overrun. Yeah, but our budget wasn't in the black, Jamie. We were a $350,000 deficit and we were- Not for, not for nineteen twenty. That was the cumulative deficit, Bob. In August, when we had done our initial projections pending any changes that needed to be found during reconciliation, we had projected a general fund surplus for RUD of $122,000. Food service had a deficit of $121,000. For a total cumulative de deficit, including what you had in the 1819 audit of that 317,929 was what was presented in the August board meeting. Was 317 or 407? 317,929 for your general fund and 153,458 for the food service fund. Which adds up to 400 and some 470,000. Four hundred and seven, just over four seventy one. Yeah. All right. Asked all my questions. Okay, anything else for Tara? Then I guess we'll move on to the uh, budget draft. So this is the second draft. Uh, this incurs all salary and benefits and function um, object codes with each, each one of these departments. And as you know, we went um, about budgeting this year, not line to line. And that's why you haven't seen the line to line budget that will roll out in December with revenues as well attached to it. So in December, you're gonna get used to seeing what you've normally seen. We've approached it this way across the SU because um, we're taking the approach of uh, zero uh, budgeting. And so we wanted to really look at what staffing do we need? And as you know, staffing and personnel are about 80 to 85% of a budget. And so we wanted to hyper-focus on that uh, the first two months. And so this includes all your staffing um, and the budget line items within these, these object codes um, for both student support and general education. Now in December, the draft that you'll see then will look very similar to what you've seen in the past, um, but we're gonna have cleaned up areas and we've been doing that as we've gone along. And you're gonna see some of the areas where it's dropped down, um, like in general and regular education elementary, that's because we've coded that position appropriately up into in the interventionist line. And so we've been trying to adjust where folks are coded. I know in times past, when you guys have looked at your expenditure reports, you've wondered why our salary line's overrunning. Well, we're trying to clean that up right now as we budget to ensure that folks are placed appropriately under the correct codes. Um, so that's why you'll see some of these areas down when other areas are up. And you'll see that when you get the detailed budget draft in December. Um, and so student support, 
Uh, not much has changed there since the last time we rolled that out. Um, we're down, uh, you know, 16,000 and change. This is budgeted for what we anticipate um, increases in both health insurance and salaries to be, just so you know, for next year. Um, it's also taken into account how we're utilizing our uh, consolidated, fed, consolidated federal grant revenues, and you'll see that in December, those revenues and how we're projecting them and budgeting them. Uh, one of the things we're looking to do, as you know, is we, in the SU, we use it a great deal of federal grants to fund positions here, and we're looking to roll those out as much as possible back out into the district. So we're looking to utilize those both for math intervention um, to increase that at the high school level. And we're also looking to use it, um, as you can see, we're trying to add a pathways coordinator, which will support students with alternative pathways, both um, through dropout prevention and for students who just want to access personalized learning that would be more project-based, experiential. And so we have a point person for students who want to access, um, you know, Vermont higher ed collaborative classes. Um, uh, sorry, Vermont, you can tell I'm getting, it's getting late. VTVLC classes, I apologize. BYU classes. Um, and so that that person would help oversee that work. They're really a facilitator of learning, but they'll work with both licensed teachers and the student for the student to demonstrate credit and or proficiency um, through a project. And Reed and I um, have been working uh, diligently this year to get some of those types of projects underway. Um, and then I'd, Reed, I think you would agree that we've had some success thus far with getting students back re-engaged um, and now back even in our building, where in the past, I think, you know, we maybe would have lost that student. Um, and so the 40% grant funded that you see there, I can fund 40% of that position because it is for dropout prevention. And so therefore I can use title funds um, for that. And so you've added an entire FTE there, um, but we've been able to do so um, based on some other savings. And I don't wanna go into exactly what each position is right now, other than I can tell you that there's um, some support staff positions that have been eliminated um, within this budget um, across the two campuses. Um, and that is part of what gets us down to just being under um, this current year's budget while also adding additional intervention in the pathways. And it covers that student support coordinator position. Um, in addition, down at general ed, um, you'll see that pre K is down. Uh, we're not changing our offerings of pre K currently. Um, we chose through management um, this year to adjust what our staffing levels were, and we've been able to do pre K um, with two uh, FTE in the pre K department, and that's what we plan to move forward with. Um, Andrea, correct me if I'm wrong or get something wrong there. I know that you'll provide details afterwards, but that's why that area is down, um, just so folks know. Uh, like I just told you, the regular education elementary, that's been coded more appropriately to cover who actually is doing intervention versus who's doing universal instruction. This, this line you see now at 1.502, um, that's who's actually providing universal instruction as elementary teachers. It's not including any budgeted money for interventions. So we've been trying to clean that up. Uh, same with regular education, middle school and high school. Some of that got coded differently based on you can see that uh, there's certain departments that have increased, like social studies, where we just coded those folks um, under the areas that they should be coded. So that's where some of those adjustments are coming in. Um, music, this, pro this uh, proposed budget doesn't replace the music teacher that we've chosen not to replace this current year. Um, that's something that, you know, we're going to look for board feedback on, but I want to highlight that. Um, the administration um, in this budget is, you know, proposing that we can continue to meet the needs um, in regards to music education without 
replacing that position that we had chosen not to replace this year. Um, and so I wanted to highlight that area. Uh, foreign language is down a little bit. This still covers, uh, we didn't replace an entire foreign language position, as you know. Um, from last year to this year, that was a management decision. Um, this, this budget ensures that you have foreign language at the high school, at the levels you currently do, as well providing at middle school. What it doesn't provide is for direct instruction in foreign language at the elementary level. And the concept around that would be is that we would look to build in more cultural experiences in foreign language at the elementary level. Um, instead of providing direct instruction there. And so that's something that the administration would like the board to, to think about and either discuss tonight and or provide feedback definitely come December. Um, we are looking to increase English language arts some at the high school, and that is to provide uh, appropriate staffing levels um, to make certain that we can pr provide that alternative um, Sorry, my phone just blinked. Uh, the alternative pathways program um, at the high school. And so, because we will use some of our regular ed staff to, to provide universal instruction there. Um, and so that would be an area that we would look to add some additional staffing to meet those needs as we look to expand our pathways. Ree, can you give me a thumb up if that's correct? That's what I remember that being. Um, and then, Math, that was just, uh, we didn't add anyone there. That was part of that recoding in middle and high school, just so you know, uh, staffing wise. Um, we didn't change any FTEs in science, just so you know. One of the things we are looking to do is juggle how we do personnel around um, serving driver's ed. Um, and so we're looking at, based on this proposal within the budget, we can continue to provide driver's ed at the level we currently do, but do that um, based on management decisions around personnel and how we use them at a pretty significant reduction. Plus this budget supports us having money set aside to provide driver's ed still at the summer levels for students we weren't able to get in. It, it might be worth uh, highlighting that uh, two years ago we we paid for a summer driver's ed program um, and the cost per student of running that was just exorbitant uh, so the plan would be that if there are students that we absolutely can't serve during the school year just because the enrollment's too high uh, that we have budgeted some money so that we could pay private tuition uh, to a driving school to make sure that all of our students needs would be met uh, we felt that was a more cost effective way of, of taking care of our, our future drivers than uh, funding a whole course section with a, a teacher in the summertime. Uh, principals, do you want to drop in and talk about what else you're excited about with this current proposal um, since I gave kind of the overview? Uh, I, I'm excited because in the in past years I've, I've brought to you uh, some staff cuts to help get a more sustainable uh, staffing ratio, student to teacher ratio at the high school. And I think if we're able to effectively uh, enroll students in an alternative high school program, that extra capacity in the regular program uh, can now be diverted to help sustain that program. Uh, so, for example, you know, we'll have a section of social studies being provided uh, from what was our general program. We'll, we'll meet uh, those students' needs and we'll be able to preserve a teaching position at the high school uh, by having them work with students who are now being sent off, off site. Uh, it also helps to get a, a more sustainable number for science, uh, which are two of our, our uh, you know, where we have two of the lower student teacher ratios. I can also speak to uh, the process in general, which has been very organized and very focused and really very professional. And I'm so grateful. And I see Andrew head nodding too. The other thing is, is that we looked at everything. Everything was on the table. And one of the things we did, we, we had your thoughts in our minds. 
So we have, I'm really proud of this. We will, we're proposing that we have outdoor education at all three grade cluster levels, elementary, middle, and high school. I think outdoor education is going to be a niche area that we're going to be able to draw families in, especially in the upper grades, because a lot of people do offer it in the lower grades. And I also really am excited. <laughs> These areas are not even, they're not in the middle school, but we're excited for each other. The pathways program and the alternative access to high school that uh, Reed is helping build is really going to be a place where some kids that don't always fit in will fit in and that we will make our school work for them and they don't have to work for our school. It's really exciting. I think I would just weigh in that I'm excited about how the process has gone so far and I look forward to potentially uh, the same process next year where we're really able to finally again compare apples to apples and not two different things. Um, and I think what I'm excited about is the flexibility right now because I know you know, when Jamie was talking with us, he was talking about some of the different things we could do in the elementary, but so much of it is contingent on, are we still in a pandemic mode or not? So I appreciate that this would allow for some flexibility that if we do want to expand having potentially three preschools for elementary, we could still do that um, given on what, what life looks like as we move forward. So um, could you elaborate on the preschool thing? Like what is this Looking so back I would say that this year we were set to go with three preschools, two on the Royalton campus, one on the Bethel campus. And unfortunately, we made final calls. So many people pulled out at the end that we couldn't justify running three preschool classrooms. And also then we did need some VLA teachers at the same time. So um, at this moment, this doesn't um, eliminate any elementary position positions. So I feel like there's flexibility and fluidity to move people around. You know, if the pandemic goes away, people come back from virtual teaching, there's ability to still have two preschool classrooms, really. So uh, if, there would be needed. one on each class. Right now we're campus. right now we're planning for at least one on each campus, but I think there's possibility to expand if needed. And okay if everything is different. <laughs> right, and would that be like, so the current plan would basically be half days for students? Yeah, I don't, I don't think our plan is gonna change. I think we're gonna offer full day four-year-old programming on both campuses with, with uh, uh, half days for three-year-olds or for four-year-olds that choose to go half day. And then we can potentially add some if we have enough interest. You got it. Good. You got it. Um, and the foreign language, it looked like it's basically the same FTEs, but like what happened with the position that we're not replacing? Like is, how are, how are things being shifted in the foreign language department, I guess is my question. So the foreign language department will be down, um, I had those notes in front of me earlier. Oh, and you want to see if I got it right? We had budgeted for 2.5 foreign language teachers. Right now, your actual is 2.2 foreign language. Okay. And what was and, that's what we actually have in the building now? Yeah. It was two points. What do we have budgeted? 2.5. So we budgeted for 2.5. We have 2.2. Yep. And this budget. Uh, is 2.0. And so what's the difference? Like we're gonna have a full time in the high school and then? We'll have, uh, I, we'll have 2.0 across middle and high school. I think that that's what I wanna say right now, um, Andrew, um, just because we're getting into some details around personnel. I think, I just believe that we should talk, have conversations with folks. Uh, prior to that, if it would impact them. Okay. Well, it'd be maybe we can have a discussion on how think you envision things changing for next time. 
Yeah, in December, when you get the line by line uh, budget based on, you know, just tonight's still conceptual, then we'll have had those conversations with folks prior. Right. But I guess, you know, if you want us to provide feedback on it, then we kind of need to know somewhat what we'll be changing. That uh, foreign language position change. Oh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is not going to change how we offer foreign language at all, other than the elementary, which is what I had said when we presented it, is that we won't have foreign language at the elementary level. That will be more based on cultural studies, but how we offer it at middle high school won't change at all. That's an absolute fair assessment, right? So I don't know if um, that's helpful or not, Andrew. Yeah, no, that is helpful. Um, yeah. Um, on the music side, I'd be curious what the vision is for elementary music going forward and how that compares not to this year, but to previous years. Um, you know, it, it seems like going without a music teacher this year is possible since music is kind of, you know, not it's very different in the pandemic than it is normally. Um, but I'm, you know, I, I'd be, I'd like to hear what the vision is for that going forward and how that compares to what we've offered in the past. Yeah, Andrew, do you want to talk a little bit about how we've been handling music and what you see for the future? I, I think it is very different, certainly right now. I mean, Carrie's here, she could even weigh in. She only just started um, going to the Railton campus. Was it a week ago, Carrie, or two weeks ago? I, so she's just barely starting and, and we've gone really slow. We're not offering um, maybe like twice a week uh, choral and we haven't really started in on in instruments at all. So, um, you know, I'm not sure Again, there's so many things that we don't have answers to yet about going forward for next year. It's, for me, it's really hard to plan um, about what it could be versus what it has been. Um, but I do feel confident that like Carrie's doing a great job and uh, it's being really well received uh, having her on both campuses. And I think it's definitely um, playing to everybody's strengths as far as the music teachers that we have on staff. So. I, it's hard for me to vision, given the uncertainty that we're looking at right now, honestly. Well, would it be possible to kind of project, not necessarily a set schedule, but you know, like assuming things are back to normal, like it seems like we should budget for not pandemic. And then if it is pandemic, we adjust, you know, the staffing as necessary. Um, so like, you know, if if Carrie's doing both elementaries, like what does that look like as far as, you know, how many times a week kids wind up getting music in elementary school? And like, when do they start doing band? And when do they start doing whatever else? Right. If, if I you think don't have I, that now, it just- I don't you know. think we have it right now. We can certainly work towards that for like the next meeting if you'd like. That, that would be helpful. Yeah, Andrew, I think one of the things that we are doing is, is I've asked all the principals across the SU to analyze our elementary schedules um, and, you know, ensure the starting points I had was, is ensuring that students um, are having plenty of, of essentials, right, based making certain they're having them at least once a week. Um, and that also we're making certain that we're prioritizing math a minimum of 60 minutes a day and literacy a minimum of 90. Um, and so that's sort of the framework that we've given around instructional blocks. Um, and I think one of the things that we've been realizing as principals that have been meeting more often is that in the essential department, um, it's been all over the place of how we've done that. And um, just even how we've gone about building the schedule, sometimes it hasn't made a great deal of sense to me. I've had some buildings that had essentials three times in one day um, and then maybe just once the other day and I, I just worry about how that's impacting instruction in general um, and so certainly I think in December we could roll out to you you know what a what we're projecting an elementary schedule would look like and why you know we recommend that we go with these staffing levels for that okay sounds good 
Is anyone else having uh, connectivity issues? You go, go black, and then everyone can see. Right, I'm having some problems. My sound is fading in and out a lot, Jamie. Jamie, when you, blink, when you blink, it goes black. <laughs> Wise guy. All right, you too, Carrie? Okay. At the beginning of the call, there was lots of audio issues. Um, yeah, it's been generally okay for me. I don't know. Anyway, I guess we can keep going and see how it goes. Um, one other question I had on the budgeted stuff. Um, how is the sharing when you have a staff shared between, um, the high school and the, what, whatever we're calling the new alternate program at the high school, how does that work? for the budgeting purpose? Like, are we just budget, like are we paying their full salary and then they spend time in the other part or? Yeah, you like, asked that before, here? Andrew. So those students would be oh, your okay. students. Yeah, so if students were placed there at the high school level, they'll be registered RUD students. Okay, so yeah, great. So then we don't have to worry about it. Right, yeah, that right. keeps it way, way clean. Sorry if I asked that before. No, no, that's all right. I just, yeah, they'll the be registered class. RUD students. Um, and because that, this will be a program within RUD. It's like if students go to HARP, they're, they're Hartford students. And then there's additional monies charged based on them accessing that program. Okay. It does keep it a lot cleaner. I agree. And then my final question on the budget, I think, um, was uh, the support staff that was moved out of the regular education portion of the budget, were those, like, when, if you look at the budget thing, were those in the top part as well? So they got added to the student support budget part. Are those in the FY21 side of the student support budget, or were they not in that side at all? They are not in the lower half. So they're all, when you look at like a current expenditure report, Andrew, including right. the support staff in the general universal instruction is all under that function code 1100. Mm -hmm. So they were, they're included there just under a separate object code. So support staff, right. um, paraprofessionals and whatnot are 102s versus 101s. So when I had to break them out to present them as the support staff versus the general instruction, that's why I only broke out their salary and benefits because all other functions of their positions are, are gonna be included in the regular ed. And when you actually get the full workbook that you're used to seeing, they're gonna be up in part of that 1100 code as well when you look at the pivot table. So they were not in F121 budget for intervention, Andrew? But okay. they are included in as intervention in FY22. Right. So that line goes up because you're adding those positions in. Oh, yeah. And it would have went up even more, but you can see we're increasing grant funding to offset some of that. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure we weren't. Yeah. Nope. Great question. And we're going to continue to ask those questions. And then, like I said, you'll see it in December, too. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have budget questions? Other board members? Any general comments on the budget and instructions? Yeah, maybe if you could just ask each board member, Andrew, to just give us a sense of how they're feeling, that would be helpful for, for me. Sure. I'll just go in the order they appear on my grid. So, Bob, go ahead. You there, Bob? Everybody's. I am. Yeah, there we go. Um, I didn't have time to uh, pull a budget down that was sent by Tara today, so I haven't had a chance to really look at it. Well, Bob, feel free to email us, please, with, with what your thoughts are, because we'll use it to inform. I, I guess I'd like to know if... Uh, um, 
read is to, I think you should be planning a budget non-COVID. I mean, I agree with whoever said that. Um, and my only question would be from Reed is, um, is everything in this high school staffed efficiently and the alternative school staffed efficiently? Did he say sufficiently or efficiently? Efficiently. Efficiently. Uh, I, I think uh, having some staff help out in the alternative program in the high school will make us a lot more efficient. Uh, um, have you decided where this, where this school is gonna take place? Have you decided that? Is it in the high school building or? Yeah. Reed, do you want to talk about the places that we're looking at? I don't think it'll be any surprise to folks. Okay. I didn't know if that was... was no, no. They're, they're aware that we're looking at, at, at that space. Okay. We're, Bob, we're looking at using the Garner Ricks facility downstairs. So we'd have a group of, you know, a dozen students there. There are, uh, what, four breakout rooms or small rooms off of that space. And that would be the core... Uh, area that students would spend together in the morning, especially working on their English and math proficiencies. Uh, the, the benefit of that is it's really close to the wood shop. Um, so there would be opportunity for students working on pathways to be engaged there. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think we have the space. That was a big missing piece a year ago uh, when we were talking about this is where would we put it? Uh, so we've got that. Um, I, I think we're pretty efficient. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you can always put more kids in a classroom, um, you know, and, and we, you know, we could drop a teacher here or there down to 0.8 and maybe we'd lose a quality teacher and, and have bigger class sizes if, if we were just looking at efficiency. But uh, I, I think, I think we'll be a lot more efficient next year than this year. But you know, that, that also depends on numbers. Um, you know, I, I think we're anticipating, we're not counting on this, but we're anticipating that we'll do a better job bringing more students into the SU because we're not, you know, we're not publicly talking about cutting positions and cutting into programs like we had the last two years. Uh, we're talking, of, you know, this budget would sustain all of our current programs. Um, and if anything, you know, it adds a little bit because it adds pathway options for students that don't exist now. Um, and we'll be bringing the outdoor program onto the Royalton campus, which we'd wanted to do this year, uh, but we'll, you know, we're committing to do that next year. Are you improving your alternative program? I mean, your um, hands-on programs? Uh, the the hands-on programs, uh, have have suffered for lack of enrollment uh, post merger. Um, you know, before the merger, they they primarily service middle school students, and so with the loss of, of the middle school students uh, taking those classes, uh, it's a reason why that's something that we've talked about cutting the last two years. Uh, so you know, I'm I'm glad not to be asking to cut those this year. And hoping that with the addition of the alternative program, we'll be using those resources more efficiently than we have in the past. And we found the middle school students. They're in Bethel. <laughs> They're doing hands-on work. Right. I think it is, the Bob, too, how we better leverage personalized learning plans. Yes. And pathways around, around having a coordinator help a student see how those experiences could tie to core content credits. Um, and so that's the work that I get excited about, um, like I said earlier, that we're really trying to launch into and leverage more. And again, as Owen says, I do think there's some areas there for, for us being a niche school, if we can get that really solid. Um, because, you know, the schools that we're competing with for, you know, tuition students, um, you know, we offer as many uh, high level classes as uh, most of those schools do, and Reed, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding is that we do. What I think we could do better than them 
is experiential learning and outdoor eds and things of that nature. And if we can offer that without taking away from the upper level courses around AP, then I don't know how you don't want to come here. Um, and so that's what we're looking to do is strengthen that other pathway as well for students that want to pursue um, more experiential learning. Because we, we do have a ton of upper level courses. Um, and this budget doesn't inter, doesn't take away from those while also building the other. Well, my experience, my personal experience was um, to expand the hands-on classes and go to an eight-period day and ask all kids to take seven classes. So those, so the hands-on classes became electives for all the students. And in Fairhaven, when I was there, um, I had 80 kids, and in, in, um, when I went there, 80 kids in um, hands-on classes, 200 kids in the study hall. And the next year, um, I put hand, I put more classes in. Increase the increase the number of periods that the kids had to be in class, and they ended up with 400 and 450 kids in the hands-on classes, and 25 kids in the study hall. Yeah, so and, and, a, and I'm I'm a big I'm a big proponent proponent of hands-on classes. Now, Jamie's talking about I'm guessing the same kind of experiences, but in a different way. Yeah, no, I think we're talking the same language, Bob, just a little yeah. different. We have all kids coming, all kinds of kids coming to school. And we need to address all of their, all of their educational needs. And different kids have different educational needs. Not all of them sit in front of a desk, look at a blackboard and um answer questions and do a good job there they they do a good job in other parts of the school and other parts of the curriculum so i believe that hands-on courses are really very important um to the students you have fewer discipline problems and more kids engaged in school All right, um, Lisa, do you have any comments on the budget? Um, from what I could see from what was presented, I was um, really glad to see that that there seems to be a savings on most things overall and nothing seems to have increased uh, as far as the bottom line and without having to cut anything. It just seems like you guys are really looking at what's working and um so it looks like you're putting a lot of thought into it i i'd have to put a little more time into looking at what was presented if i had any more feedback but overall i i like what i'm seeing chris yeah i like uh you know i like that we're starting uh the way that the process is is being presented uh, and I think like Andrew you know I think what you all described for you know coming to us maybe next time with like an example of what the elementary school day will look like uh, and stuff uh, I think that'll be helpful for us to to understand some of the the staffing decisions uh, you know like in regards to to music and some of the other things so you know what is a What's a kids' day look like versus you know, and how the staff is being utilized to to meet the needs? Rodney, yeah, uh, I like the way the direction everything is going. Uh, the last couple of years, I really haven't been pleased with, with the budget. Obviously, it. You know, it hasn't worked out very well, and uh, we're be on the right track. Uh, so, from what I can see, it's uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the direction we're going in. Uh, 
Um, I guess one question I would have, um, like what are what are these projected for like health insurance? Uh, and one thing that's really killed us in the past. Terry, you want to talk about that? Uh, the current projections that I have built in, Andrew, were based on the initial rates projections released earlier this year. Once the final rates are released, we can make updates if necessary, but I'm comfortable with what's in there. Okay. And again, what, Andrew, what we, did, we did budget 100% HRA. Yeah, we did make that adjustment for the first draft of the budgets because that's really something that we need to make sure we have appropriate allocations for. Okay. Considering so you know, with the new, with no from new like, contract, the the board is responsible from first dollar forward. Right. Okay. And what do we budget for that now? It was like sixty percent or something. Um, let me just go back and double check, Andrew. I, I know I it fluctuated in between districts. I'll get right back right. to you. Maybe we're fifty something. Okay. Well. And do you do you know what the health insurance increase was projected to be? Tara, between 12 and 18, health insurance projections between 12 to 18. Yes, sorry, I was looking up the HRA thing. Yep. Yeah, between no, 12 right. to 18, Andrew, depending well, on the plan. Well, I'm impressed you guys are still showing projected savings then, because that's pretty crazy. Well, again, I mean, there's some big areas here, right, that we're using some title funds for. Right. Um, and there's a few positions not replaced in this budget. So on the title funds thing, are are these like right now we're kind of taking those positions, not putting them in the budget if they're funded by revenues. Is that changed from what we did previous year years? Like is this money that we're using for something else that we're now using for this? So we've increased federal revenues to you guys to offset some of your interventionists, specifically in the area of mathematics. But also another area, if you look at MTSSA, that position, I'm providing you guys with uh, additional $50,000 in Title II funds to offset that position. Um, so what was so that money crazy. being used for before, I guess is my question. Like, was it spent at the SU level? Yeah, okay. spent at the SU level. So when we restructured, remember, those positions from the SU, they, Title II money was covering those positions. Okay. Andrew, the, we were in the current FY21 budget, we funded 50% of the HRA exposure. Okay. Do you know, do you have a feeling for how that's going? I asked Datapath again yesterday for an updated utilization report. They've been having some technical difficulties on their end, so they haven't been able to give it to me for first quarter. Um, when I looked at it last, we were trending between 45 and 47%. Oh, and, and that's for everybody in the SU. And that would be like the end of last fiscal year. Okay. I just don't know how it works. Like, is it? And that's about three months used... behind in claim processing. Okay. So this is With the sorry, way it so works for last it. fiscal year. Not yeah. Not the last report year. I got was for um, the end of FY19. Okay. So, so that I'm would sorry. be. Like the full utilization for last year was around 45 to 47. Less about three months worth because it takes about three months for claims to get processed. And then you put COVID in that mix and I'm sure it's going to be higher than that. Okay. Because of processing and the way, you know, the, the hospitals and facilities in the spring. I do anticipate that that utilization will be higher than the last report that I received. But I can get back to you as soon as I have that information from Datapath. Okay, thanks. Just as a general consumer and as someone who is well engaged in healthcare, I can let you know that forecasts for healthcare utilage, utilization when the state was shut down, whether that be New Hampshire and Vermont, was significantly lower. And it didn't start opening back up until June. Though Tara's statement might be correct in some aspects, I need to clarify the utilization numbers that she spoke to. I 
right? I guess if we're doing 100% of the, we don't really need to worry too much about what it was in the previous years, but it's good to know that the utilization might be lower than it would have been otherwise last year. Anyway. Um, so does anybody have any more comments on the budget or anything else? Okay. Well, thank you guys for presenting that. And yeah, I echo what everybody else said that it was, you know, I like the, process, the way the process is going so far and nice to feeling like we're on top of it. All right, so we'll move on to the policies that are warned for adoption. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven policies that the policy committee has already reviewed and approved. These policies have been on the books now uh, for at least six weeks. Um, they were warned in the paper um, and they're gonna be going in front of the full SU board for adoption on Monday. You're the first based on timing of how we warned in the paper. You're the first, first board that can take action on it. Um, and so I'd be looking for you guys to move and approve uh, A24, B22, B34, D1, F28, F29, and F30. Okay, does, do we have any comments or discussion on any of these? Um, do we want to talk about them individually or just as a group? Andrew? Yep. Um, I'm going to vote no with A24 um, because nothing to do with Jamie, but um, past, past, past experiences with this board and relationship that it's had with the superintendent, um, I think, makes it very dangerous. So what specifically is, uh, do you have a problem with? Um, if, I don't want to discuss anything in open session about that, but I'm going to vote no against, I'm going to vote no for this policy. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure why we couldn't discuss it in open session. I mean, basically it's saying that we set policies and the superintendent implements the policies, which is kind of the way it is now. Um, I guess. I, I believe everything that's in this policy, except I am just not, I'm not convinced that we're ready for a CEO yet. Okay. Um, do you have, like, how would you prefer it to be worded, I guess, is how I would. I would like the superintendent to build relationships with each board, working relationship with each board, and uh, the boards work, have, a, have a working relationship with him. And that's it. Well, is that different than what this policy suggests? Yeah. How so? I, I, sorry. You really, I wanna, you, really, you really want to. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we need to move on it. And so, like, we're being asked to approve it or not approve it. And yeah, so, I'm going to, I'm just going to vote no. I don't care what everybody else does. Okay. You, can vote, you can vote yes if you want. Um, you well, know. I mean, I was certainly planning on voting yes, but if, if there is some problem with it, I'd like to, to know what the problem is so that I can. Well, <laughs> I I mean I guess I just I must say too the the comment from a board member to say that they don't think they're ready for a CEO as your CEO I find offensive. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I would say if there is any reservation about it that this is the time to discuss yeah. it. Uh, but you know. But after it gets adopted, I mean, I think, you know, in here, 
you know, this is the time to dissent, but then after, if it gets approved, you know, from what I, you know, remember of, uh, of you know, board governance and stuff, it's, you know, the board individually, we might dissent, but then after it's adopted, then, you know, we all work to support it. So, um, you know, after this, you know, whether we vote yes or no individually, if it passes, you know, then it's our, our duty to support it, right? Right. If you I pass mean, it, I'll support it. <laughs> well, so is there anything that you can say publicly about what you think that this could cause, what problems adopting this could cause or? No, no there's nothing. No, not I mean, do you want to discuss it? Should we discuss it in pri private session? Is like, I, I'm not sure how to proceed here. Well, Andrew, guess, just to advise you as your superintendent, you can't discuss policy in executive session. Okay. You could well, discuss thanks. personnel in executive session if you choose. Okay. Well, I guess. Um, I think you should just, we should just vote on it, Andrew, and I'll just vote no. Okay. I mean, I. I think it would be more effective if you could elaborate on what your concerns are, because right now, you know, there's no way for us to, as as Chris says, like it's either going to get adopted or not. You know, there's no way for us to improve it or change anything or anything if we don't know what the issue is. So, you know, it's we we should try and get on the same page if we can. And it's hard to get on the same page if we don't know what you know the issues are. Yeah, it's nothing you. There's nothing I can um, that I want to uh, talk about in an open session. And Jamie's right; you can't discuss policy in ex, in executive session. So I'll just vote no. Okay. Um, does anybody else have comments on, do we want to do these individually? Um, okay, so why don't we start with A20, uh, A24, Board Superintendent Relationship. Does anybody else have any comments on this one or discussion? Uh, does anybody want to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Motion to approve A24. To vote on it. <laughs> well, I think the motion needs to be to adopt. I'll make, a motion. I'll make a motion to approve or adopt A24. I will second that motion. Okay. Any discussion? Um, hearing none, why don't. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Say nay. Okay. So the motion passes for our adopting that policy. Okay, moving to the next one. Um, B22, complaint about personal personnel and instructional materials. Is there any discussion on this one? Or motion first? Sure. We'll make a motion to approve B-22. Is there any discussion? Okay, I'll move on to the vote. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, uh, B-22 adopted. Move on to B-34, records retention. I have a motion. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? We'll move to policy D1. Proficiency-based graduation requirements. Retain a motion. Can I ask a question about this? Sure. 
Um, I have a question for Jamie. Um, are we going to change our reporting system, our report cards? We're looking to change our report cards, Bob, at the elementary level to be more standards based. I know that. Proficiencies. Yeah. At the high school level, we have not discussed changing the report card other than in addition to reporting out on two transferable skills. But the same way we report out on credits um, and overall course grade would remain the same. Reed, did I get that right? Yeah, you, you did. Uh, one thing that we probably will do, Bob, is uh, I saw an example today from a high school in New Hampshire where they have a legend that translates the, the numerical grades that we have into proficiencies. Uh, so, for example, a uh, you know their scale used an 81 to an 89 represented proficient on their their legend that went with their report card. So I, I think that uh, we'll probably do that. Uh, and I've got a discussion with with some teachers tomorrow uh, that may get to that point. It, it won't happen this semester, but maybe uh, for second semester. But the the number grades aren't going to change. Okay. Um, you still have U.S. history 85 as your grade. Um, that may be, you know, and the legend may say, uh, you know, 85 is pro highly proficient. And then we might right. say that a 70 to 79 is proficient and a 65 to a 69 is uh, developing proficiency. Because I don't want to handicap our kids that are headed off to college because they don't have class rank or a grade. Yep. Yeah, that one, I think that's our concern as well. So I don't know if this is a place to make sure that doesn't happen, but I don't know how the rest of the board feels about it, but I feel uh, very strongly about this. So until the colleges change their way of uh, admitting students, um, I think that we need to maintain a number grade and class rank. I don't think I, I don't see this policy as uh, talking about how we report out, Bob, but more so what type of opportunities we give kids to demonstrate credits or proficiency. Yeah, I, I understand that. Um, but I but they have a way of coming back and haunting you later on. As long as everybody understands that we're not going to change our grading. Um, and that we're going to continue with class rank until such time as colleges figure out a way of admitting students um, without grades. Um, I just want to make sure that our kids are graded and have class rank. I know a lot of high schools are going to proficiency-based report cards, and uh, I don't want to go there. All my kids have gone through college. Some of you have some kids that are going into college. So at least, if, you know, I've expressed my concerns. I hope it doesn't happen. And, you know, this policy is okay with me. I agree with Jamie. I just want the reporting to be done in grades and class rank. Yeah, no, clearly we got to have GPAs and it ways to to demonstrate how students have achieved, Bob. Yeah, that that's definitely schools that had missed that boat had had to learn the hard way around that. But I want everybody to know it has happened out there. Yep. Okay. Um, so I'll entertain a moment motion to approve this policy. I'll make a motion to approve the policy. A second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Seem to have lost uh, Rodney. We need Rodney for our quorum. 
No, we still have four. We have four. Yeah. He's back. Okay. So, Rodney, we were voting on uh, policy D1. D1. Yeah, I I, I exited out by mistake. Uh, Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, did you vote on it or? We did vote. If you want to add an I or an A. There we go. Okay. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, Policy is adopted. Um, okay, now we're on to F28, disposition of assets. Entertain a motion to approve this policy. I make a motion to approve this policy. Any second? I'll second it. Okay, any discussion? All right, hearing none, um, all in favor? All right. Aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Okay, policy F28, been approved. Now we're on to F29, investment. In a motion to approve policy F29, or adopt, or whatever. As long as everybody understands that if we invest money or put money in a bank, that we have we almost have to guarantee the principal, which is exactly what it should be. So whoever does that investing or whatever we invest in needs to understand that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I make a motion to approve F29. I'll second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we've adopted policy F29. I just closed that now. Okay, um, on to F30, budgeting. I may entertain a motion to adopt policy F30. I'll move to adopt the policy. I'll second. F30. Um, any discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor? Say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Okay, we have adopted policy F30. So that's all the policies. Thank you all, we've been busy, so. Mm -hmm. The next next one coming forward would be um, uh, a policy in regards to the work that's been, we've been doing around equity um, and race. Okay, we look forward to seeing that when when you have that ready to bring forward. I have a question. When this goes to the full board, um, this board votes as a, we're gonna, all three of us vote according to the way the board voted tonight. That's not necessary, Bob, no. I mean, you can still vote how you'd like as a board member of the SU board. Well, I don't think I don't think that's okay. I mean, just our whole board voted to support the policies, so I think we should. I think well, I, as, as a board, we should support it. But I, I mean, we are separate boards, so like, you know, we have adopted that policy for our board, and now it's a question of whether it's going to be adopted for the supervisory union board. So I don't know. Um, I guess. That's a question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, we'll move on to number 10, new hires. Agenda item 10. Is there anything on this? No. Nope. Want to mention? 
Okay. Uh, we've got another public comment. Is there any other public comment? Okay. That sounds like we don't have any public comment. So we're on um, to an executive. Oh. Go ahead. A public comment. Um, the biweekly news is great. It allows that disconnected parent who is driving his or her students to school every day and not ever setting foot in the can in the building to be a little connected um, in this remote realm. Um, the in and out of classroom models are interestingly um, fun in a way that I would have never imagined. I thought student conferences at the elementary level as um, Principal Bowen had represented were, went really well. Um, the team SNAP application used by athletics has some advertising that is frustrating, but really, really coordinates communication. And I think the teachers are doing an awesome job getting through COVID stuff and um, it's amazing. Thanks. Thanks so much for that feedback. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Tammy. Okay, is there any other public comment? I think Tammy might be our only public, so probably not. Wear a mask, wash your hands, and keep your distance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we're gonna move on to executive session personnel. Um, so let's, this one, who do we need to ask into executive session here? This would, this would just be me, Andrew. Okay, um, and then we had a, second executive session for negotiations and that'll just be you as well okay yep so i guess if we can enter executive session or can we have a motion to enter executive session good night everyone thanks tara i'll make a motion to enter executive session for a personnel matter and you're done with us jamie After yes that? all right be well everybody stay safe thanks owen thanks Reed. thanks Andrew, except she's already left. Okay. Um, do we have a second to enter executive session? I think we need one. So, so yeah, I think it should be second. Eight twenty-nine. We'll take that as Lisa seconding and entering executive session. <laughs> so we'll, we'll enter executive session at eight twenty-nine. Coming out of executive session at 8.51. So I'll make a motion that we accept the superintendent's recommendation on the personnel matter. I'll second okay. that. Okay, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. Um, so now we'll um, entertain a motion to Enter executive session on. Uh, so I'm negotiation. Motion that, yeah, I make a motion that we enter a second executive session to, for negotiations update. Okay, I'm going to log out at this point. There's no more decisions to be made, and this is not really things I need to hear. Okay. Okay. Have a good evening. See you, Rodney. Thanks. Thank you, Rodney. Do we have a second to enter executive session? I'll second. Okay, entering executive session at 8.52. Same, okay. Exiting executive session at 9.05. Um, our next meeting date is, do we have any future agenda items or other before we move on? I think not. I think your December meeting is gonna be hyper-focused on the budget. Yeah. Um, We'll have reports to the board. Um, we'll have ADM too, which will be part of the budget. And of course, we'll be looking at the revenues as well. So you're gonna have that whole budget um, to digest and, and for us to look at that night. So I think we need to make certain we provide plenty of time for that. Okay. Well, one of, well, one of the budget items that we talk about eventually, I don't know if it'll be in December, but would it be like the food uh, budget? Uh, and so, you know, that and then, maybe you know my kids being remote i don't get any feedback on what the lunches in the cafeteria are like right now uh 
Uh, so, but you know, just maybe an update too on just yeah, maybe we can out. add food service as a whole discussion item, Chris. But that yeah. will be part of the budget. But I think food service as a discussion item makes a lot of sense. Okay. Jamie, have you heard sure of the gets back on the agenda? Jamie, have you heard of uh, provision two? I have. Okay. It's never been talked about at the, at the board level. Yeah. Provision two? I haven't heard of it. It's provision two, yeah. Um, just uh, for the sake of the notes, for future agenda items, I'm going to add food service as um, as a topic. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm going to get VLA back on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Chris, that that I just I had the regular reports to the board placeholder and. And we were going to um, do a quick uh, mention of what happened with the buildings and grounds committee that we just we had a brief meeting today and sorry you missed it, Chris, um, but it was really just strategic and the next time we meet isn't going to be till January 7th. So there won't be any new information, but it might be worth just making a mention of that, that the fact that we did meet once already. So under reports to the board, I'll have um, facilities committee. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, there's that there, there are those minutes that Reed sent out today. Um uh, so we can probably update off of those. Um so yeah, I saw one of the items for the next meeting was to talk about the lighting study that was done a while ago, which would be good to talk about. Mm -hmm. Um would it make sense to have subcommittee meetings meeting minutes sent to the full board so that Everybody kind of get the sense of what's going on in this upcoming. I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. And of course, Bob, when we talk food service, we can talk about provision too. Okay. Um, I just have one other question, Jamie. Mm -hmm. The line of credit that we have doesn't get spent unless you approve spending of it? Correct. Okay. Does Tara understand that? Yep. Okay. At the finance committee meeting, I didn't think that she did. And I, I just want to make sure that's the understanding that we have. Yep. No, she would, she would definitely come to me for approval to draw down on that. Okay. Just, I mean, just like any, any uh, expenditure over a thousand dollars doesn't get processed until she comes to me for signature after it's coded. Okay, we all set with future agenda items. Our next meeting date is Tuesday, December 15th. Um, I think we are at the end of our agenda. Like to Thanks. Thanks to you. Good job. Uh, so uh, I make a motion to adjourn. Second that motion. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks. you, Andrew. Good job, Andrew. Thank <laughs> you.